Hello, everyone. Welcome to Life Boost here. My name is Ryan Barrio, and I would like to thank you guys all for taking the time to listen to my podcast. I'm available to listen to on over 35 different podcasting channels and 10 social media platforms. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Jeff Abbott. He is from Burke, Virginia in the United States and is currently a leadership instructor, writer, presenter, and speaker, and also a retired Coast Guard captain. He was a Coast Guard for over 30 years prior to that with exceptional knowledge and experience. He has earned his doctorate in business administration, a professional ocean engineer, and master's of science degrees from MIT and has a bachelor of science degree from the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. Jeff is a founding member of MIT's Military Alumni Association and served on their first board of directors. Jeff is passionate about helping people be more effective contributors to a better world. Pleasure to be speaking with you on my podcast, Mr. Abbott. How are you? Thanks, Ryan. It's a pleasure to join you. Look forward to yeah, talking to your listeners. It's going to be incredible to gain insight material uh, from yourself and really try to make an impact on other people to be successful as a leader. And it's going to be great to gain insight in regards to that. Let's first talk about your journey in becoming a Coast Guard. What made you want to get into this career? Well, I was uh, in high school. I was in, uh, in Boy Scouts. So I really liked getting out in the uh, outdoors. Um, and I just really, um, you know, enjoyed the environment, protecting the environment and uh, nature and so forth and so on. And uh, but I grew up in the Midwest, so I'd never really been near the ocean. And uh, there was an opportunity for me uh, to apply to the high, to the uh, Coast Guard Academy, which um, was a great opportunity because it was a free college education. I knew that I wanted to be an engineer um, and they had a strong engineering program and uh, it got me near the water and it got me to see uh, you know, part of the world that uh, I'd never even been to Connecticut before. I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, so it was a great opportunity for me. That's incredible. And it's nice to be able to dive into something that you're extremely interested in. You had good opportunities because of that, right? And how did you mental, uh, how did you manage your mental health as a Coast Guard when you were in that career? You were in this career for over 30 years. Well, um, it was varying times. It would be uh, stressful, um, but you had got some great people that you work with, um, your colleagues. Uh, Coast Guard Academy, a lot of stress, especially that first year, because it's like a, it's like a boot camp with, with heavy academics. Uh, on top of it, so you're doing uh, you're doing push-ups, uh, and then uh, then you have to uh, go to calculus class and so forth, and um, you know so that's stressful. And the way we got through that, you know, really was we we had friends and we'd talk with friends and we'd study together, uh, but we'd also you know we'd study for finals. I've got a uh, my best uh, colleague who became uh, my best man at my wedding. Um, we would study for a few hours on marine science, for instance, and then we play risk for like a strategy <laughs> game for, for, for three or four hours. Then we get back to studying, you know, so you now we pull an all-nighter and uh, do what we can. Um, later on in my career, uh, it could be, uh, oftentimes stress could be driven by the organization or by events. Um, so some of the, the events that I've experienced, um, I had command of our research and development center when the terrorist attacks of 9-11 took place. And uh, we, we had 17 active duty officers and about 80 civilian scientists and engineers. And we took a lot of those folks and said, let's put research and development on hold. Let's help the operational Coast Guard um, just in case there's other terrorist attacks coming. Um, I deployed down to Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans uh, when it breached the levees and that city flooded. Um, and then I got pulled out of there after about four days for Hurricane Rita. And I had to go down to uh, to, to Texas, to Austin, Texas, uh, for a few days to prep for that hurricane. So there was there was a series of back-to-back -back hurricanes that year, and I was stationed in Washington D.C. I wasn't even in the Gulf Coast uh, stationed there. Um, the other thing that I've learned is that many times uh, stressful situations drive innovation. You don't have enough resources to do the job, but that does not relieve you. Um, of the responsibility of fulfilling the mission for the agency. You know, if somebody's out there and in trouble, the Coast Guard on the water, Coast Guard will rescue them. Uh, they need to find a way to do that. Um, you know, if there's an oil spill, we need to find a way to protect the environment to the extent that we can, you know, once it's happened and so forth. So that drives a lot of innovation. So um, if you don't have enough staff or you don't have enough funds or whatever 
oftentimes what you can do is you can collaborate with others. And the Coast Guard, one of the things that they really excel at uh, is working with the people in the ports, working with people in, in, uh, in our states, here in the United States, uh, the port authorities, working with the maritime industry, working with other federal agencies. So we work with Customs and Border Protection to uh, help keep migrants and drugs out of the country. Um, and that can kind of be a force multiplier. So you can, um, you know, you can leverage your resources and their resources and together accomplish both agencies' missions. Um, and that's, that's pretty powerful. And you make some powerful friendships along the way um, that can really help out, not just now, but years into the future as well. Yeah, it's insane that you've attended a lot of world crisis issues and also being able to deal with these situations and you have to collaborate with multiple agencies in order to be successful, right? It's no longer just yep. just the Coast Guard itself. It's multiple team dynamics coming into one to really try to create a solution. And that's why leadership is such an important tool in order for you to be successful, but also uh, for you to advance within your career, right? It was super important sure. for you to be able to develop relationships and to develop um, background about certain agencies so that you can complete a task, right? And so I think that's pretty touching, actually. It's pretty cool that you were able to create an impact in that way where you got to travel all across the United States and you also had fun in the process, right? So yeah. I think that's incredible, right? So why was learning leadership something important to you? Well, that's... Um often how you get, that's what you have to do to get things done. But that doesn't necessarily mean, Ryan, that you have to be, quote, unquote, the leader. You don't have to be the team leader, the supervisor, the executive, the CEO. Um, I'm a strong believer, as you and I have talked um, about, all of us can lead. You know, and I call it leading from the middle. And I became very passionate about this later in my career. One of the jobs I had, I chaired the Commandant's Innovation Council. My job was to encourage people to be proactive, to take initiative, to improve their part of the Coast Guard, whether it's a team of, you know, a small team of four or five, or whether it's the entire aviation community or the ship driver community within the Coast Guard. Um, we can all do things. We're all smart. We can see ways that we can do things better. We can, we can improve the situation. We can be more effective for, in our case, the American taxpayer or, you know, um, the public safety um, you know, customers and clients that we have. Um, but it's really um, a powerful concept that we can all lead. And by leading, I, what I mean is we can either initiate actions or we can influence positive actions that get meaningful impacts. Uh, oftentimes we're influencing our peers, maybe influencing our superiors. Um, likewise, influencing people from other agencies, our partners, um, that we need to rely upon in the uh, uh, and they and they rely upon the Coast Guard as well. Yeah, and you have a book that you wrote, and it's called Unauthorized Progress: Leading from the Middle. And and you you were just talking about leading from the middle, right? And the connections that respond to that, right? What are some strategies that people can do from leading in the middle? Well, this is a quick. I don't know if you can see that, but uh, that's the book. The forward is written by uh, Admiral Thad Allen, who was uh, one of the commandants of the Coast Guard, the, the senior executive. And um, what I developed was there are observed, actually, were 12 um, strategies that people use to successfully lead from where they are. So one is, is just being, um, be the expert, you know, and that doesn't mean be the expert of, you know, the the pandemic or whatever, but it means in your specific niche, know more about that particular issue than anybody else. Know the pros and cons. Know if you have an initiative, what the strengths, but also the weaknesses, you know, what those are. Um, there's another one, which is uh, find, a, find a senior champion. If you can find someone who, you know, perhaps an executive, um, perhaps your team leader who supports your idea, uh, that can cut through a lot of red tape and you can get things done quicker that way there's um uh just being proactive you know and uh you know and, and taking immediate action in fact hang on just a minute uh i've got something right here so some of the other strategies uh involve uh having a bias for action 
and every one of us can do that. You know, let's not sit back and wait. Um, you know, let's make sure if we, if we know the mission of our organization um, and we know what needs to be done, especially if time is urgent, um, you know, let people know, hey, unless otherwise directed, I plan on doing this. And that puts seniors on notice that if they don't want you to do that, they need to let you know. Otherwise, you're saying, here's the situation I'm in. Time is critical. If I don't hear back from you, here's my plan of action. This is what I'm planning on doing. Um, networking, partnering uh, with, with others. There's, uh, uh, do I have time to tell a short story? Oh, yeah, you got tons of time, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so there's a gentleman I met at a joint um, Homeland Security Department of Defense exercise um, at one of the forts in the, in the D.C. area. And uh, we were in a tent. And he's a really interesting guy. And uh, in his capacity, he'd been an advisor to uh, some U.S. and Afghan forces over in Afghanistan. And he was over there, and uh, there's a situation where non-governmental organizations or NGOs, um, by that, it, in this case, Red Crescent and Red Cross, were, were taking medical convoys, truck convoys, through the mountain passes to remote villages in Afghanistan to provide uh, medication uh, and medical supplies to families, the elderly, uh, children of um, the Afghan community. Um, what happened, though, was the Taliban and some of the drug warlords were ambushing the convoys in this one mountain pass. Um, and good people were dying, you know, trying to help the Afghan people. Um, their drugs were being taken, their trucks were being stolen, and it was a bad situation. And the U.S. military's solution to that was, well, let's, um, let's go ahead and move the road, you know, so it doesn't go through the mountain pass, which sounds reasonable. The issue, though, was that where they were going to move it was going to take it right over the cemetery uh, of this Afghan village that had been there for probably 800 to 1,000 years. And so they had all their forefathers, all their ancestors uh, were there. And this gentleman had enough emotional intelligence, and that's a key factor of leadership at all levels, um, to realize, now, this, this is probably not the best solution. There's got to be a better way because the Taliban could come in and talk to the people within the village and see, you know, the Americans, they don't understand our, our religion. They don't understand our tribal customs and how important that is to us. Um, you know, and they might use it as a recruiting tool for, uh, for young Afghans. Um, and he said, there's got to be a better way. So uh, this gentleman, I'll call him Dan, he went to the U.S. military commander and he asked them for um, permission to talk to the village elders and to hold off building the road for two days. And they said, sure, fine. So he goes to the interpreter, he talks to the elders, he shows them the, the map, shows them where the ambushes are taking place. And he says, look, I don't know what the best solution is, but I know there's gotta be a better solution than paving over your cemetery. Um, even though that will get these drugs that are needed by your families um, to them more safely. And the elders actually, very much appreciated that. They considered that a matter of respect that he would, Dan would come and talk to them and ask their opinion. And he, they said, okay, come back in two days and we will have an answer for you. And Ryan, he comes back in two days and he sees the most amazing things. He sees old men and young boys with pickaxes and shovels and they're digging up the bodies of their ancestors to move them to a safe location where they could be protected and honored as their ancestors, so that the Americans can then come in and pave the road so that they can get the medical supplies to, the, to their family members and their elders. I mean, just, you know, and the, the reason I tell that story is that um, I call that chapter radical inclusion. And you never know where the best answers are going to come from. Always ask the people being impacted their thoughts, their suggestions. Uh, because if, if the Americans had said, well, why don't you just move your cemetery, it would have come off as being very arrogant and very, um, at a minimum, you know, beyond rude. I mean, I mean, just very arrogant. But they came up with that solution themselves, and, um, and it allowed for a win-win for everybody. That's an incredible story where if you apply emotional intelligence, you apply empathy on situations and yep. really try to create common ground with people. 
exactly. and really create solutions, right? And this is something that we can do in the workplace, even here, right? And yep. it's insane that this is an incredible story. I've never heard of this story <laughs> before. And it's, uh, it's, it's crazy, man. It's insane. Um, and it's really special to see that the Afghan community was accommodating this, right? And that they were saying, oh, okay, well, they did ask us and they were appreciative of this and the empathy is there. And that's where you connect with the emotional intelligence side, right? And really just trying to grow within that. What is some strategies that you would recommend to somebody that is trying to improve on themselves in the workplace? Okay. Um... Well, one thing is you want to be a continual learner. I mean, I'm you know, just turned 67 recently, and I'm still learning, and uh, and I'm going to learn from this you know, from this experience as well. But continually learn, you know, reach out. Uh, the pandemic has taught everybody new ways of doing business. You know, your podcast, for instance, I suspect that maybe before the pandemic, uh, you were doing something else. You know, I teach leadership, and um, and I had always done it for the most part. In, in person, you know, in the classroom experience. Again, I can read the body language. I can see the quizzical expressions when I need to explain a little bit more. Um, I can see the light bulbs go off when it's like, aha, I get it. I understand. Yeah, you know, yeah. That's powerful. Harder to do virtually, but it can still be done. You know, we can still find ways to do that. Um, so I'm, a, I'm an old dog learning some new tricks uh, in the virtual world. Um, but there's so much more, you know, we can learn. You know, uh, team, you know, how do we evolve teamwork how do we do teamwork virtually you know when the team can't physically be together uh, and yet we still have a mission we still have some some important work to get done how do we do that um, I read a fair amount I encourage people to to read you know now we can you know we can watch podcasts you know, such as your podcast you know um, we can watch YouTube you know we can learn things I was putting up some shows yesterday and I wasn't sure how to get the anchor bolts in there just right go to YouTube, you know, so be a continual learner. That's one of the most, uh, most important uh, issues. And then just be really be proactive, you know, take initiative. Um, you don't have to have all the answers, you know, don't try to do everything by yourself, but find some friends some colleagues, talk to them, ask people for advice, you know, ask, ask them for some help. And you'll be surprised at uh, how much people will help you. When I was writing the book, um, I had a friend help me. Uh, she calls herself a book shepherd, not a publisher, but a book shepherd. And uh, she, what she taught me was, don't be afraid of the big ask. And by that, she says, if you need something, um, and if you're sincere, you know, in 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 your need, um, don't hesitate to ask somebody. So I asked former commandant of the Coast Guard. You know, I, I mean, I used to work for the gentleman, but uh, Admiral Allen, if he would write the forward for the book, and he said, Jeff, I'd be happy to. You know, and then I reached out to five leadership authors who I didn't know that well and asked them. And actually, I reached out to 17 people to write like short inscriptions, you know, one or two sentences about the book. And I thought, well, if I get 30 percent of them, that would be great. Every one of them said yes, every single one of them. So don't be afraid of asking for help, asking for advice uh, when it when it can be beneficial. You know, but also, likewise, look for the opportunity to do the same for other people as well. You know, give give something, pass it forward, as they say. Yeah, no, this is incredible advice for myself, considering, like, you know, I'm only I'm only 26. So, you know, for me, this is a lot of great advice. And it's good for me to bring these skills to myself and to help me grow as a person. Right. And it's really interesting to hear your stories and how you collaborated with people within your book and and also in regards to that right so yep. what is another cool story in your book that you could share with us because i really enjoyed the first story too there was that is really cool yeah. well there's uh yeah there's a couple i understand a lot of your audience are public safety or first responders so when i first went down uh, to hurricane katrina this was after the levees broke um i had a a small team with a specific communications capability that we wanted to try out there because it looked like the like the cell phones weren't working. And what we didn't realize is that you could text, but you couldn't talk on the phone because it took too much bandwidth and because all the towers were, were inoperable at that time. So um, I'm flying, in, and we couldn't fly into New Orleans because everything was flooded there. So we flew into the Coast Guard Air Station in Mobile, Alabama, and, um, and then 
from Mobile, Coast Guard helicopter flew us to the USS Iwo Jima, which was moored at the pier in New Orleans. And that's where all the federal employees, so FEMA, Coast Guard, um, 82nd Airborne, you know, small, you know, small groups of folks were there, federal employees sleeping on board the ship. But while I was in Mobile, I was talking to the commanding officer, Dave Callahan, and I asked Dave, while I was waiting for the flight, what was it like flying into New Orleans? You know, the, the, those first couple of nights. I mean, it must have been weird. And said, Jeff, it, it was uh, it was eerie. He said it was like flying into a sea of fireflies. And I said, Dave, I don't understand. What, what do you mean? He said, Well, you have to understand, it's flooded not just for a few blocks, but like tens of square miles. I mean, it's it's you know, Lake Pontchartrain just emptied into that part of the city. And and he said. Um, as we got closer, we could see these flickering lights. But he said, but there's no cars on the road. There's no headlights because it's flooded. The aircraft warning lights on towers were out. We had to be really careful because the emergency generators were now dry. Um, he said there were no billboards lit up because there's no power. And as we got closer, we saw these wavering lights. And it looked like fireflies. And as we got closer, what it, we realized what it was was not just thousands, but tens of thousands of people standing on their garage tops, on their balconies, on their rooftops, waving flashlights, waiting to be rescued by the Coast Guard and, the, and others. And you know, overall, the Coast Guard rescued over 33,500 people um, during, hurricane, during Hurricane Katrina. I mean, it's the most massive you know, rescue that the Coast Guard's been involved with. Um, but he said, but I got to tell you this story, Jeff. He said, one of my pilots dropped off the rescue swimmer uh, on a rooftop. And the rescue swimmer, they're the ones that jump out of perfectly good <laughs> helicopters into 20-foot seas to rescue people in floundering sailboats and um, people that are at risk of drowning in the open ocean. Uh, a little different in an urban environment with telephone poles and wires and everything. They have to be careful. Um, but he said, uh, I'll call the rescue swimmer Charlie. You know, the, the pilot told Charlie, hey, Charlie. You know, we have to refuel. We'll be back in about 25, 30 minutes. Just hang tight. So Charlie's on top of this rooftop. And when the pilot comes back later, Charlie is just a mess. He is angry. He's anguished. He's frustrated. We talk about, you know, mental health issues. Charlie is on the edge. He is, he is grieving, but he's also, excuse language, mad as hell. And the pilot said, Charlie, what happened? We were only gone 25 minutes. He said, sir, when you took the helicopter away and the noise died, died down, I could hear yelling and pounding from underneath the roof that I was standing on. And there's a family trapped in their attic. And the water was already above the second story windows. I had no way to get in. I tried pulling the shingles off with my bare hands. I got a few off, uh, but then there's plywood, plywood sheathing. And I tried kicking with, through that with my boots. I couldn't get through. And you know, damn it, sir, I'm afraid that family might drown because I didn't have the right tools to do the job. And I joined the Coast Guard to become a rescue swimmer to save lives, not to lose a single life or a single family. And I'm very upset. That night, when the helicopters returned from New Orleans to Mobile around midnight, Charlie and two of his buddies uh, went to a local hardware store. And my understanding is they bought every fire ax they had in the place. So the next morning, every Coast Guard helicopter out of Mobile was equipped with a fire axe. So if they encountered the same situation, they could chop through the roof and pull people out to safety. Now, they didn't go through normal cha procurement channels. Um, you know, even under emergency procurement, it takes seven to 10 days. They had like 36 hours. You know, they knew the water was still rising, and then they'd be lost opportunity after that, and people would die. Um, and they probably thought, you know, if we spend $400 of our own money and it saves one child's life, that's a cheap investment. I would, I would make that investment any day of my life um, to save a person's life. Um, wow. And, and, and that's, you know, and, and, you know, it's just, it's a very moving story, but it's also, um, it's what people who lead from the middle do. This is a first class petty officer. This is not, a formal officer. This is not a captain, not an admiral. This is one of the people that are closest to the front lines. They know the mission. They know what's at stake. Um, and they took, you know, he took that initiative. Um, I want to contrast that, compare that to another Hurricane Katrina story. So that's operations, life and death. 
Uh, many of our first responders are familiar with that, but a lot of people are on the support side. You know, so what does leading from the middle look like for me? Um, so when I got back uh, to Washington a couple of weeks later after the two hurricanes, uh, I was in a congressional hearing, and I run into a senior DHS civilian uh, named Rich that was who was with me down in New Orleans. I said, Rich, how are you doing? Great to see you. And he said, Jeff, thank goodness for the U.S. Coast Guard. And I said, okay, there's got to be a story behind this. Is it the rescue swimmers, the helicopters, the boat drivers? He said, no, the procurement specialists. And I said, really? I said, I have not heard this story before. You have to tell me some more. So Rich went to a logistics center that's being run by FEMA, which is the Federal Emergency Management Agency uh, for the uh, for the for the U.S. And he's observing their operations. And uh, at that point, there had been a national emergency declared for that part of the country, uh, and the federal government was picking up a lot of the costs. So they would funnel everything, all the first responders, so local, state, federal, uh, would flow their procurement requests through these logistics centers. And what Rich noticed is that um, there were procurement specialists from FEMA, but also some other federal agencies assisted them. Um, so there was a, um, what they call a storekeeper first class petty officer from the Coast Guard who was helping out. And Rich noticed that all the FEMA procurement specialists had in their inbox box about you know, a stack of papers about that big, you know, waiting to be filed, waiting to be processed. But the Coastie only had about half an inch. And he couldn't understand why. And he's watching, and he's, you know, and he goes up to the supervisor and he says, "Why aren't you giving the coasty as much work as as the other procurement specialists? You know, is it because he's not familiar with emergency procurement?" He said, "You know, he looks capable." I said, "Oh no, he's fine. He's just processing everything faster, much faster." So Rich is intrigued now. So he goes and talks to one of the FEMA procurement specialists. How do you process your documents? And he said, "Well, I look at the request." I've got a government credit card. If it's under $2,500, uh, then I have the authority to uh, to review it. And I open up our book, our FEMA guidance on what we are authorized to buy. And if it's on that list, then I buy it. And if it's not, I either decline it or, or reject it, or I set it aside for my supervisor. Now, you have to understand, their supervisors are really busy because they're getting these from all the procurement specialists that work for them. Um, so Rich th thinks, okay, that's pretty reasonable. And then he goes and talks to the Coastie, and he says, how, do you, how are you processing your paperwork? He says, well, I look at the request. I've got a limit of $2,500 on a government credit card. If it's over that, I send it up to my boss. Uh, if it's under that, though, what I do is um, I take a look at what we are specifically cannot buy, what we're prohibited from buying. If it's on that list, I don't buy it. But if it's not on that list, I'm going to give the first responders the benefit of a doubt that they're doing the very best that they can. And we've never encountered a situation like this um, where a city, an entire city is flooded that quickly. Um, so they're being pretty creative in some of their solutions, fire axes, I mean, you know, all sorts of things. Um, so I'm going to give them the benefit of a doubt. And I don't know if you can see the, the difference in the mind. And, a shift in mindset there from I can, I'm can i only allowed to do what it says I can do, which was kind of the theme of procurement specialist perspective, to unless it says I can't do it, I'm going to use my judgment. I'm smart. I'm going to use my judgment to do, and I know the mission, to do what needs to be done. Now, could he have gotten in trouble from a very uh, aggressive auditor? You know, perhaps. But I think he could also make the case that there is a cost to the status quo, and, and especially in a crisis situation. If I don't do anything, people might die. Property will, will be damaged. Um, and, and, you know, and if I know what needs to be done um, and it's within my authority, then I'm going to take that initiative. So being proactive, taking that initiative. Um, and those are two of the Hurricane Katrina stories. So, so one is on the procurement side, you know, on, on the, you know, <laughs> yeah. support, you know, so because you know, I have people support, you know, our frontline mm -hmm. operators. Uh, and the other one is life or death, pulling people out of buildings. Yeah, but it's interesting that it all still all comes together, and everyone still comes together as a team, and has to find these solutions. And like you said, 
the person had the open mind to say, you know what, I'm going to take this throughout the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to trust my coworkers and I'm going to trust the situation. And if it happens, then at least I can articulate and explain that it was an emergency situation and that it did happen for the right reasons. Right. And it's great that you're all connecting everything back to being proactive, back to making appropriate decisions based on following through your heart, but following through with agreement with everyone. Right. And it's really great to hear your stories and to hear your perspectives about this. Right. Because in the workplace, a lot of people tend to be pretty negative in the workplace yeah. and say, Hey, uh, what can I do to do the least amount of work so then I can get out of here? Right. Or there's people that are the hardworking ones where they work so hard, but then they forget their families at home or you have the middleman. Right. And I think that it is super crucial and important to do well in your job and to really succeed in trying to find solutions. And some of the strategies that you just gave me are great ways that people can be successful is by being proactive, by asking questions, by not having judgment on the whole situation and having an open mind. And, and that is super crucial within law enforcement, but within uh, first responders and military, right? We have to make active decisions every day in order to be successful. And it's good to hear that you're like, you know, you don't need to just have this one answer. There's a million answers to this one question yep. and you can find a solution. Yeah, I, I think um, one of the important mental attitudes to have is instead of dwelling on what we can't do, you know, our hands are tied, we can't get more funding or whatever, is to say, well, what can we do? based on what we have. And uh, Admiral Allen in the uh, forward to the book has a great, great quote from Arthur Ashe, uh, the famous tennis star. And uh, Arthur Ashe was saying, you know, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. And, and really, you know, and, and part of that is talking to others. Well, I don't, you know, I don't have funding, but I got some staff that I could put towards this. Oh, you've got staff? I don't have any staff, but I've got funding. You know, maybe we can work together on this. I mean, but just, you know, and that's the um, collaboration piece. So that there's, uh, can I, have, do we have time for one more story? Oh, 100%. Yeah. It's okay. Very, okay. It's, okay. It's exciting. It's um, very interesting. So we talked about Hurricane Katrina, and that's being proactive and taking individual initiative um, based on based on what's needed for the mission. We talked about Afghanistan and um, the importance of radical inclusion, include everybody, especially the stakeholders, especially those people that are impacted to understand their perspective. And one thing on that is um, when you have an idea or initiative, don't ignore the ch what I call the challengers, the people who say, you know, they, they might imagine themselves being disadvantaged or losing out somehow uh, if your initiative goes through. Um, you want to understand what their perspective is uh, and try to mitigate that to the extent that you can, because if you can convert those people, your challengers, to be for your idea, uh, that's huge. I mean, that, that's really huge. So the other story is uh, several years ago, and this is still continuing, you know, even today, there were California wildfires, and they're threatening, in this case, it was San Diego's being threatened. Um, and we had a small group that didn't, um, well, it, it was it was a small group across some agencies or four of us and we didn't think that there was enough communication between local state and federal agencies that sometimes the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing or what their capabilities were which is more important so uh, one of them happened to work for the secretary of the air force and i was working at a think tank supporting dhs one was a helicopter coast guard helicopter pilot another one was a fema a contract employee and um, the Secretary of the Air Force received an email requesting satellite imagery of um, the area where the fires were. and But they wanted not just imagery, because they had pictures, satellite pictures, but all it showed was smoke. It was the visual range. They needed infrared to show where the hotspots were, because what was happening, and your firefighters would appreciate this, hotspots would evolve into more forest fires behind the firefighters and it would threaten them but also communities that we thought were safe were protected were now at risk um, and you couldn't see through the smoke to know where those were so they were requesting assistance from the department of defense from the air force in particular 
uh, to get satellite infrared uh, photographs to show where those hot spots were. Um, so my, <laughs> so my, uh, my, uh, my friend who was a colonel in the Air Force, he sent it out to the four of us, you know, and we said, anybody have any ideas, any suggestions? So that's, again, asking for help. You know, where can we get some help? And I was at a think tank at that time, and I sent it around to some people at the think tank. You know, so we got scientists, engineers, uh, policy people, and one of our VP, vice presidents said, hey, you know, there's somebody from NASA who works for the Home, Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate. I'm going to give him a call and, and see what he knows about this. And he gets in touch with his friend from NASA, and it turns out the guy from NASA says, oh, yeah, we already send from NASA satellites, infrared uh, imagery of forest fires to the National Fire Center in Boise, Idaho. But nobody had made the connection between the people in the midst of the crisis in San Diego and the Emergency Operations Center and the National Fire Center in Boise, Idaho. People in Boise didn't know San Diego needed that because there's forest fires all over the West, you know, Canada and the U.S. Um, so oftentimes the bureaucracy can be so big that the left hand doesn't know what the right hand was doing. And within a couple of hours, they started getting the infrared uh, satellite photos that they wanted, that they needed to protect the firefighters and to protect the communities. Um, but you know, the lessons in that one are collaboration is huge. Leverage your network, whether it's LinkedIn or uh, you know, your, your first responder community. Uh, and don't be afraid to ask, ask the big ask. And, uh, and you might be pleasantly surprised. You certainly are not going to lose anything, lose any ground, and you might actually get a big win uh, for your organization, for your nation. Yeah, no, this is uh, this is incredible information for myself. This is incredible advice that everyone should take in to be successful within themselves and their business. And I couldn't thank you enough for taking the time to explain sure. some of your stories and to explain your background and to truly get to know who you are because you are an awesome person like hearing your story and hearing your background and just actually getting to connect and really see what your book is about but also getting to know you as a person and, and correlating the different skills and traits in order to be successful is huge and i'd like to thank you for allowing my viewers to learn something today and to actually be successful within their day-to-day -day life right this is something sure. That is important, collaborating, really trying to grow relationships and being respectful and being open to learning and having great emotional intelligence is key to being successful as a, as a leader, but you don't need to be at the top in order to be a leader. You can still be at the bottom and still be a leader. And, and it's special. And I, and I do thank you so much for coming on to my podcast. Sure. If I could just have one final statement. So the name of the book is called Unauthorized Progress leading from the middle, uh, stories and proven strategy, strategies for making meaningful impacts. The term unauthorized progress can be confusing to some. What that means, that doesn't mean that you're going behind your supervisor's back. It doesn't mean- Oh yeah, no. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it doesn't mean that you're, you're working in the dark confines of the, uh, you know, the lower bowels of your agency or whatever. But what it means is that um, you know the mission of the agency uh, you're not waiting for our very busy supervisors to tell us what to do. You're, you're taking initiative. You're being proactive. You're not, again, you're not trying to go behind back channels or anything like that. Uh, but you're not going to be wait. You're not going to wait to take action that needs to be taken. You know, you, you're going to be uh, upfront about it. And uh, sometimes there's some risk there, but uh, more often than not, people say, "Ryan, you know, great job." You know, yeah. thanks for thanks for reaching out. Yeah, that's great. And I want to wish you wish you the best with your podcast. Uh, it sounds like it's an awesome podcast. I've heard a couple of the episodes. I encourage your your listeners to uh, to do likewise and uh, keep up the great work. Oh, thank you so much. And your books are available also on Amazon, correct? That's and great. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. So I'll put that link in the description of my podcast. And if people are interested, definitely click on that link of the description and you'll be able to purchase yourself one of his books. And his book is incredible. We talked about it throughout this podcast. And I hope that everyone has the privilege of buying this book and reading it. Thank you so much, Jeff, for coming on to my podcast. I greatly appreciate sure. it. And I appreciate your advice. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, my, my pleasure. And thank you for the service of everyone out there.